Willard and Gaitel Chess at Tuggan Chill, Sarum, Ven Chagas, a chance, Mwinia, the course in migration, a Chagas, got a meal of Mahagay. Uh, that was in our, in our own ancient language. Uh, but distinguished guests, um, uh, Mr. Camonieri, Professor Vell, all of you distinguished. It's easy, let me... Uh, I think, you know, people would be very disappointed if I gave the speech that I have circulated in advance. And those, uh, those, those who are here from the press know that there is a much... Better greeted. It's part of the bonus of turning up that when I actually change things slightly. So may I abbreviate by saying I'm deeply honoured and overwhelmed by uh, the, the, by your presence. And I do want to say, uh, uh, Rector of the University and your colleagues, uh, you honour me by turning by coming here in this brief visit. I'm, I, I'm making a tumult. I'm very, very, very deeply, uh, uh, very deeply grateful to the, my friend, the, the president of Malta, uh, for the, the, what he has arranged for my visit and the warmth and enthusiasm with which he's greeted. And I'm accompanied by the uh, representative of the Irish government from the uh, cabin, is uh, a professor. It was the professor of social English, is social protection and community and rural development is very very appropriate for the theme of migration. Um, I think I want to say a few words first about migration. In a way, I I began my interest in migration and the sociology of migration in depth about fifty two years ago at the University of Manchester. It was an interesting experience because at that stage the, it was heavily weighted by anthropologists. Uh, some had come home from Africa, uh, some had been sent home from Africa, and they were now, as it were, studying their own people. And indeed, only the, because the, only the Irish Sea divided us, uh, but they hadn't anyone in their doctoral program uh, f from Ireland, so they would occasionally say to me, Michael, you must someday tell us about your own people. Uh, it was interesting because it established, if you like, about how close you could be, and yet at the same time how very far you could be uh, uh, from understanding, uh, understanding each other. But cutting to the point straight away, uh, Studying, I worked as a, an assistant to a, a distinguished professor who was writing models. Uh, we were looking at the causes of migration. There, of course, there's a very old literature going back to 1897 on uh, Ravenstein's laws of migration and so on. And people were only at that stage beginning to put together the fundamental uh, bibliographies of Mangalan and, and, uh, and all of those others. And of course, I wasn't, I was had been a migrant myself. Uh, my uh, father's family had immigrated to Australia. My sisters had immigrated to, to England. So in a way, I had made my mind up very, very early on that I would try and see things uh, from the migrant's point of view. And I, I, that presentation that we've just had by Mr. Cavalieri just now is an absolutely brilliant contribution, in my view, uh, towards understanding the process and the necessary elements of dignity and courtesy that are necessary in the exchange of information as people are moving. But let me, where I think, as I said, you, about I, I am as a, soci, as a sociologist. Yeah. Sometimes I, in the, the midterm of my own writing, I would upset some of my colleagues by saying that the, so, the sociology, uh, the social models, had been singularly insufficient for understanding migration. And this is uh, something that is, why did I say that? The models were overdetermined when you had people speaking about what pushed people to migrate, what attracted people to migrate. The famous push-pull model, which arrives in the Commission on Immigration Studies in Irish case about 1948. It's overdetermined and so forth. And yet what was coming clear from what I was looking at and so on was that something else that was very, very interesting. 
People on the Move, which is the title of one of the great works on, on, on migration, or if you're going back even to Thomas and Znaniecki's study of the Polish peasant in America and Europe, all of these. The fact is, it is a world of its own. But the key word to, to, to make sense of what I'm saying now, as it were, was transience. The models assumed that the natural position of people is to be sedentary. In fact, in, in the Irish case, the, the, the refutation of this, there would be very few people in an Irish parish who didn't have somebody who had migrated or had migrated themselves. But yet the assumption was is that you were fixed sedentary. And these fixed sedentary over-determined models, therefore, were very much less than, for example, the literature. So you look at the literature in Irish, Macaulay, and you look at the literature uh, uh, even against a Patrick, McGill in relation to uh, the migration and so on. And what you find in the literature is that you have all of the sensitivity, the sensory evidence that is missing in the overdetermined models. Then there's something else I pushed on to this to try and understand in what we began to know in relation to how people deal with each other. And that is the assumption that the, those who constitute the communities in transience, transience is what literature captures, but the models miss it. That is, but there are revised models, and particularly as people moved into um, traveling with migrants themselves, it changed. But what I think is interesting to me, as well as I delve further into it, uh, was in relation uh, to the, the different in the personal relations, uh, including intimacy. And as I looked at that in many cases, and if you began as I was teaching then at this stage, of course, in the sociology of literature, this is not reducing the literary to sociological. It is reducing neither to a version of each other, but to trying to get, as it were, an insight that would in turn, in a way, should inform qualitative sociology and so forth. So all of this has always been in my mind. Now, in relation to the general area of human rights and, and so forth, uh, the... It, it is. It was. It has been. In in the Irish case, particularly since the Iraq War, in particular since uh, significant movements in Africa, there have been uh, uh, there, there have been uh, new challenges. Uh, how uh, first thing I've said, uh, the next point about it is is the way that migration is presented. Uh, it very, very rarely presented. That, uh, I think in the last year for which statistics are available, 12.2% uh, of gross global GDP is provided, is present, is provided by migrants. Uh, the other part of it is, is that which is challenges pol politics and challenges interpretation, I, I, I think, is that... Uh, is that we ignore the migrant sensibility in ourselves. I wrote in one of my latter pieces before I assumed my present position, maybe I might have said it in one of my speeches, we are, after all, all migrants in time. And, and curiously, without movement out of it all in many cases, then now quite, it's, it's, for some it's infamous, but still it has very, very great value. The study of, of uh, Arnsberg and Campbell in Ireland has an interesting description of the movement and the people between the, in the generations. Uh, somebody dies, who's to sit in the chair near the fire? And the person who sits in the chair near the fire is migrating, in a sense, because their relationship to the family is, in fact, has changed. So it's full migration in that sense, in many cases. The other has been in relation to what composes us, what, of what are we composed. Uh, since uh, Homo sapiens, we, we, we've been, uh, we're all eventually, we started off in Africa, all of us. And that enables me to turn to something that is very important. Of course, now we are, have been since on our television screens and in brave reports from journalists and people, indeed elected people who have gone and they've seen massacres and they've seen huge abuses and uh, in in Ukraine. And. Uh, our, not only our hearts, but our solidarity and our support goes out to those who are in, uh, resisting and uh, um, 
what is uh, any more an, an innovation. It contradicts all the pr so many principles of international law uh, and so on. But then again, uh, one of those next distinction, which was always very important to me, was the distinction between voluntary and enforced migration. And enforced migration doesn't require someone with a gun tending you to leave, although, of course, there are so many people, a huge increase in the volume of displaced people in the world is, 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 is astounding. But, you know, while that image of what is happening in Ukraine was on our television screens now and so forth, occasionally there would be other images would come of people dragging their dead animals, the goats without a peak on them, uh, across the, the burned earth. And uh, we can't afford, even though we have to deal with what is before us now in Europe, we can't afford to deflect our gaze from a, bur a planet that is burning. And with the consequences of climate change are destroying life and destroying possibilities for the future. I was in Somalia during the famine, and make, helping make a documentary on the Somalian famine. And I, I recall very clearly uh, meeting the past people in the pastoral society, and it, where our sensibility must be able to take into account the full human experience of migrant groups too, such as pastoral people. They have elaborate rituals in the case of Somalia, which is a very, very, very rich oral culture. The written culture com comes later with elaborate rituals uh, when animals die, when humans die, and so forth. But you can't actually, if you don't replace their way of life and their animals, and you offer them money instead and you move them to a totally different uh, urban existence, you have quen helped quench culture. And this is why our sensibility in relation to the, what is behind uh, any migrant reality is so important. And it's, it's, this is the value of the presentation I've just had, with its emphasis on evidence-based. In the end of the day, it isn't the person who is in front of the person asking the questions dealing with the migrant in many cases. You're dealing with a fellow citizen of the world. You're dealing with another human being and so forth. And I have, in my... Remarks earlier, I just said uh, a, 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 a word about that. I have in my speech all of it is something I very much, you can take it as, as, as read in a way because I do pay compliments to those who have invited me here and I do celebrate this agency very, very much and you have my warmest congratulations and more than that, uh, and more than that my support. And I do think uh, uh, as well that there's something very pleasant, very good from my point of view in it as well, is that there are elements of it working from the ground up. The, the capacity to anticipate, because the capacity to anticipate, for example, in, in a way uh, uh, that is, is so important. If we just envisage for a moment about what perhaps we might have avoided if we had been able to anticipate what arises when you have forced movements of people speaking one language into another area where there is in fact another language and how language itself has been can be abused um, both in relation to establishing even basic rights of citizen participation in relation to education in relation to public service and so forth and all over the European Union there are more than I think Professor Ulrich Cockle spent two years living in what are the border areas in Europe. I, I remember looking at that anthropological work and seeing in many cases how you should be able to anticipate ethnic, linguistic and so many other points of tension. I know at the Irish government's period in this, when it was in the chairmanship of the OSCE, uh, certainly did some very in good anticipatory suggestions in relation to Transnistria, I remember. And, uh, but this, the, the, this is very, very Im, 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 important uh, work. I think as well, I realise this, that uh, you know, about diplomacy uh, uh, is so important. 
let me say immediately to those of the Centre of Diplomacy about uh, the moment the, the instrument of diplomacy is incredibly important. I have several times during this visit here spoken about how we in fact cannot, uh, uh, the future is bleak if in fact the future of Europe is to be the best customer for the armaments industries of the world. Uh, the uh, reality uh, of it is, is that it conflicts end to end with conversations in shared spaces, which is the great test of diplomacy. And the more of the deep understanding of what behinds the assumptions of those who are in the different relationships uh, to any conflict and war, uh, the more pow uh, powerful it all is. In a curious way, therefore, in many cases, uh, the classical training in diplomacy, it, where it had been in relation to be within the frame of the state and interstate relations and so on, where that world is over because of the degree of interdependency in which we are now. We are, as I've just said, made with brief reference in relation where we are in relation to climate change. Now, let me be positive and say, for those people who were, in fact, working as diplomats, what a great moment it was in Paris. What a great moment it was when we speak about sustainability. And I think we need now to recover our great moments and say, if we are to have great moments again, and they're informed by, 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 by diplomatic uh, practice, it will not come uh, uh, from us threat threatening each other on the basis of uh, on the basis of military spend uh, uh, our, our, our capacity. I, I do think too, in relation to it, is uh, I have mentioned uh, the th the threat of climate change. Uh, I've also been looking at saying that uh, when we're addressing the problem, uh, there is such a serious issue. Uh, I'm delighted to know that we're moving on, I think, fairly positively in relation to the future of the great oceans now, and that which is beyond national jurisdiction in relation to the seas, and that will be very, 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 very important. But, of course, in relation to biodiversity, uh, which is uh, in incredibly important. There is, a, 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 when things are going badly, a reluctance to be able to shake yourself out of bad practices. Uh, I think there's no one, I think, now seriously doubts the science that is there in relation uh, to climate change or the threat and uh, threat of biodiversity. Uh, what is more difficult is getting people to accept that models are wrong. The model, for example, of unending growth uh, cannot be, should not be sustained because it is related to, to, its, to, to the, the, what has happened in relation uh, to both. Then in, in both the loss of biodiversity and in relation to, to the in global warming. I think, for example, of those work, that, and there's always, there are always people struggling against to allow the new to be born. I think of Ian Goff's fine book, Heat, Greed and Human Need, which combines the, the whole question of the challenge of climate change with, with, uh, with issues of social justice. And the accompanying book by, by, by his partner in relation to universal basic services. Uh, why, would it, why has it to be regarded as such an incredibly mad idea to suggest that meeting the basic services across the world in relation to health, uh, uh, housing, education, uh, shouldn't be a noble idea. And the reason it isn't a noble idea is because of the particular bounded, bordered pursuit of interest by the most powerful. So in the main cases, should it, this can say that's just uh, another one of those Michael J. Higgins' speeches. I have actually um, lately uh, dropped my restraint in speaking of what I now beginning to call now uh, a species failure. Uh, gifted as I was late in my own thing, I had to have the opportunity of doing work in philosophy and work in, 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 a num in some different subjects. When I think of the long run of the rational and the idea of the, the idea of progress, which stood behind colonization and domination in so many parts of the world, and how it traced its way back uh, uh, to 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 Raycart, to Descartes, I would often refer to that as the Cartesian fallacy of assuming that unless it can be observed and measured, it isn't important. But then you add to it all of the great phenomenological work and the rest of it. But even with all our work, 
in many cases. There's been such a great failure of the rational, a failure in relation to the different capacities and so on. Occasionally, this is given great voice uh, in literature, and it is not accidental in many cases that many of the finest contributions in literature, including those of James Joyce, has been, in fact, by those who have to move into an exilic relationship with what is presented to them as the rational and, ex and the sensory experience of, of where they are. I think we've come through a dark time in relation to COVID. And in relation to that, you know, in many, many cases, it's sometimes said, once again, we fall back. And actually, we're, be, we, we're, uh, we're a bit loose with language when we say we all cooperated in relation to response to COVID. We did not. Uh, we failed to actually allow global access to vaccination. We are still failing in relation to allowing uh, global access to anticipation of future pandemics. And uh, we are still holding back in relation to ch fundamental changes in, in our own, in, in own behaviour. And therefore, it is a great time to be young, uh, to abandon all the, to not to abandon, but to move into and look at the shape of new paradigms that will combine issues of social justice, issues of responsible uh, ecology, and issues of awareness and sensitivity. And all of this in the way when, when I mention, often I very didn't use when I mentioned that migrants produce 12.2% of the global global GDP. I don't want to make it too material because there is a joy in it. There, is, there, is a, there will be a better joy. There will be better forms of intimacy. There will be better forms of experiences of the imagination and of the spirit when in fact actually we're operating more responsibly in relation to our planet, in relation to our fellow human beings, in relation to all of the life forms of the world. I, 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 I have to say that uh, as president because it's, the, it's, it's if I am to aspire to have hope, uh, 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 that, that is where it is. I think uh, as well as that, in relation to uh, having had listened to a brilliant presentation of what the agency is doing, and I congratulate uh, uh, all those, and that I guess Guimra Spanak, Tarkak, Mekashula, Kosantaoki. I just want to say that it is important how all this is explained, how this is presented. Uh, it is highly healthy. Uh, uh, there is no great person who believes in ecology, social justice, and uh, and, and good economics being combined. Uh, none of them owns a, a group of newspapers. Uh, there's none of them seeking to dominate the, the social media and so forth. So therefore, the work that goes on in, in, uh, um, um, by, by diplo in, through di diplomacy must always, in fact, actually be, of course, be fact-based. But it needs now to take on a sense of urgency. Where we are in relation to the situation uh, in, in the Ukraine, a ceasefire is a ceasefire, and a ceasefire is preceded by talks. Humanitarian corridors are achieved by people in difficult circumstances uh, speaking to each other. And then in the turn, when this is over, one has to ask in many cases, how did this come to be? Not through recrimination only, but how matters that are similar must be avoided. And therefore, in the interesting thing, therefore, is that what, as a former academic and now as president of Ireland, I've said again and again in one speech after another about words, the importance of words and language. Václav Havel said words can kill, words can liberate, and so forth. In relation to the language itself, we must get, if you like, a language that is appropriate to our new condition, that takes on a sense of, uh, of moral engagement. And now back, uh, and back, back now to the migrants. I remember uh, when I was doing, uh, 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 looking at some work, I visited the sugar workers uh, in uh, Telford and for the sugar campaign in Britain, people from Connemara. And the big test was you got a bonus if you could last through Christmas and some would break the contract and they'd go home and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get the bonus. But the closer one is to the migratory experience in many cases. Sedentary is associated with property and respectability. 
but you shouldn't have to own anything to be respected. That's a fundamental in relation to many, many cases. And when I saw about the, my, the communities I knew and studied in um, many cases, the warmth of their personal relationships, the tendency, for example, for them to push close together uh, for warmth, uh, the manner in which, if you like, what is their entire world has been carried with them uh, and so on. And therefore, in many cases, then, the encounter of the migratory and the sedentary. And it is interesting that the representative here of the Department of English, it is interesting in the case of the wonderful, the great the man who broke the mould in the novel, James Joyce, uh, 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 was moving. Some of the finest work we have in, in, in written in English and in Irish uh, uh, has, has come uh, out of the migrant experience. And therefore, in another thing then, too, uh, when you, after wars, but without wars at all, uh, people were always, people have always been moving. So let us say, therefore, there is more empirical evidence to suggest that we are, the population of the world is migratory rather than it's sedentary, and it has to be so. So therefore, then we move on, and, and I think uh, in, many, in, in, in many cases, in the end, I hope that the the work of the agency that I've just said at Mr. Gallieri that he I hope it goes around the, the the European Union. Let's think before if it didn't, you see. Uh, when we were dealing with the refugees from the Africa, so many from the Iraq, that tragic Iraq war, or from Asia, from and from Afghanistan and, and else, the question would arise: Are the people who are arriving in such numbers? a threat to our security. And therefore, the first people that were asked to start processing the arriving of new people were people who, in fairness to them, did not have the training that Mr. Kelly has been describing to us in relation to processing information. And then the next part of it were people who always, with a kind of a half ear to what populist thinking might be doing, and the effort turned into finding uh, uh, opportunities for rejection. Uh, I, I rep, uh, before when I le before left Parliament, I had to do it. my secretary said to me, "You are handling eighty percent of the cases of the people who are applying for asylum and for family reunification." And then to other thing, another person as he was passing through the office said to me, "And there's no votes in it." And the point about it, in many, many cases, when I recall those files, somebody would have taken a clever decision in one of the European Union countries. I, I remember Denmark was one. And then the different senior councils and others who were actually on the appeal system for the files, they all, you could go like lightning to the file this size to find the Danish basis for a rejection and so forth. So let us hope that that is all over. So I hope that in relation to migration, that Mr. Kelly, I hope that you will be migrating madly across the European Union, and I hope that people will be receiving you, and that we'll have so that we can hear the very valuable work that that we have there. In relation to a common European system as well, it is I think important to go beyond being coy. In many, many cases, there are very, very wealthy members of the European Union uh, with, if you like, challenging demographics, certain amounts of labour shortage, and, in fact, who have welcomed, uh, who, who, in fact, are able to absorb, if you like, new arrivals uh, into, their economic, into their economic system. I think the common system is essential. The global compact of refugees is, imp is important, but also is a common position. And a common position in relation, I re I'm speaking in Malta, it's just not good enough to say any more. We all have responsibility. We all have, respons we have responsibilities in relation to migrant welfare. It's a collective responsibility, and it's one that must be resourced, and it must be resourced by those who, in fact, are having the most first uh, uh, contact with it. I think that uh, the minister who is here with me, I congratulate. I can tell you about one of the, the emphasis that she has put, which is good initiative, is as migrants arrive, moving beyond the state and having community sponsorship. 
because there is the first thing of ensuring your basic fundamental rights, then there is ensuring your access to to, across a raft of rights, and then there's the other thing, the anticipation uh, of of the fullest participation. I finished by making one of the last points when I was looking at evidence-based work in many, many cases. In the first, uh, where it has been studied, let us say, I think in the Syrian refugees who are over the, the, the Syri- who are over the Turkish border. I've seen some work there. And within the first two years, the, the, when asked what do they want, the migrant wants to return home. That home has, might have been fundamentally changed. But it is right up there as though to return home. Well, if that is the case, well, then you are immediately recognising the person in transition in relation to their basic needs of health, housing and education and so on. But they are not returning to the same place. So therefore, you, that, that is an issue where there is a good policy opportunity. And then in the third year and afterwards, they're anticipating a new source of destination. Again, in relation to that, both the source of destination and the potential migrant can, in fact, with good preparation, be, pre- be prepared for that. And then in turn, then after that, in many, many cases, there is, of course, the hot potato in relation uh, uh, to what one is talking about, whether one is talking about the circumstances circumstances of arrival and citizen participation and issues of integration and so forth. And once again, the language thing will hit you in the face in many, many cases. You have to be able to accommodate respect for diversity uh, uh, into all of that. I've spoken very, very long, but you must uh, 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 accept my apologies because it is an area in, in which I've had a lifelong interest. Climate change I say, so let me repeat again, given what we're dealing with in Ukraine and in which we must be responsible and we must do our best, let us not not deflect our attention from the urgency uh, of of issues such as climate change. For example, 3.3 billion people out of a global population of 7.9 billion are affected already. So it isn't only beyond wars and conflicts, beyond what it is in relation uh, it is in relation to conflict. The climate crisis is our greatest crisis, quite frankly. And I think that we were making progress again. I said, let us hold on to our good moments, Paris and in, in New York, but also Glasgow, uh, where in fact we made uh, uh, some progress into what might be a more, on a more sustainable and ecologically balanced future. And all of the time as I speak here, I'm very conscious of a time long ago, in 1992, when I was inter- speaking about sustainability in Rio, when that conference was taking place. And those most affected were, in fact, actually on the Greenpeace boat. And the Business Council for Sustainable Development had been given, in fact, full status as a state on the the platform of the United Nations by Morris Strong. And that is in many, many cases. Let us be very clear. The powerful, we are not begging them to be responsible. We are requiring them to be responsible. And I think that for the message has to be very hard on, the, on the, those who are holding power and exercising it in these circumstances in which we uh, uh, face ourselves. And my last is the new young, and he is young, sociologist, I think, of the fine uh, work that is being produced by, from the uh, Har- 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 Hartmut Rosa, a student of Habermas, who for the University of Jena, and he has his book, Resonance. In the end, it is about how we resonate with the world. Uh, Joyce would, uh, I think, like this. It is about how uh, the bow strikes on the the violin in many cases and the sound that it produces. As we start our days, do we look forward, in a way, to darkness, misery and challenges? Are we due to the great possibility and hope that there is there when things are done differently? It's been a great privilege to have been invited here and to have an association, however brief, with the University of Malta and with its diplomatic section, and also, of course, a privilege to be here and hear about the work of the agency. Mila Buikas, Thank you.